Thank you, Lee. That was really nice. Uh, I was saying before, that's the first time I've been in the congregation for a worship set in seven or eight years. Um, it was really lovely. And uh, I also wanted to say that, you know, even with that moment in the second song where things kind of fell apart, the third song, there was a lyric about no mistakes being wasted, nothing being, you know, and, and even in my worship service this morning at the Air Force Base, I, I dropped a part of the song and had to move through it. And I would say that those moments even seem to enrich the vulnerability, the genuine spirit, you know, so it was really nice. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to have yet another chance to, to hone my, my preaching skills, to kind of take the thing I do by myself, which is constantly trying to un better understand and, and seek truth and to be able to share that with anybody and have it be meaningful. Um, I'm happy that my, my family's here, my parents and my brother is here from Birmingham, and my wife Kristen's here today. It's really nice to have everybody. Um, so uh, for the last several months, here at Hope, we've been talking about um, the kingdom of heaven. We've been talking about Christianity in action. You know, what does it look like to, to be like Christ? What is like What are practical ways that we can put on Christ and, and try to enable God to move here and now? And um, so in keeping with that, uh, I was reminded today that, um, I think Bo's mentioned this before, but it's one of my favorite bits of Bible trivia that uh, the first thing that Jesus says when he begins his adult ministry is the word metanoia, which we've translated into the word repent. And I think for us, the word repent carries a lot of connotations of stop what you're doing, which that's fair. But there's a subtlety to the word metanoia, which allows you to also read it as to open your mind, to change your thinking. And I think if we take that, the idea that Jesus is constantly trying to show us how to change the entire way that we're approaching reality, the entire lens that we're viewing our lives through, um, that his teachings can take on new life and be immediately more practical to us. Um, you know, the, the theme that we've been coming back to most often is the idea of giving freely. Um, when you recognize that the life that you're, you're experiencing right now, the breath that you're using and, and the pulse that's you know, helping your organs operate, all of that's given to you. You're not doing anything to deserve it. You didn't do anything to earn it for yourself. It's just coming in. And if we can learn to take everything that we've got and give it away as freely as we've been receiving these things, um, Scripture and, and the Gospel seems to indicate that that makes us all the much more a part of God in motion uh, when we stop holding on to things and trying to keep them still. Um, so... Uh, Every time I get the chance to speak, I'm going to try to, I, I usually come back to the idea that the gospel itself is a message of freedom. It is an offer for us humans in this life to set aside the things that are keeping us from being all that we can be, being what God has designed us to be, um, experiencing this life in its fullness. And uh, I think that the way that we, we reach that transformation is that we, we the freedom is, is uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, the gospel is a message of freedom through transformation, which requires surrender. And I think the surrender is the hardest part for us. So instead of just talking about it, um, let's go ahead and read the scripture. And then I'd like to go back and, and kind of address uh, a couple of verses at a time and try to break them down and try to find some of the subtleties in this, in this passage. Um, you know, for a lot of us that grew up in the church, this is a really familiar passage. This is the, the story of the, the rich ruler. So starting at uh, Luke 18, uh, 18 through 30. It says, And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? 
But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Um, there's a lot there. It's a pretty dense passage. And uh, the things that stand out to me immediately are that at the end there, um, the affirmation that Jesus gives his followers is along the lines of last time I got the chance to speak here, I was talking about, I used some more verses where Jesus says that he came to turn us against our, our families, and it seems contradictory to the, the love and hope of the gospel. But, you know, when we were talking about it that week, we, we were talking about the idea that when you start to challenge the systems that exist, especially when it comes to wealth and, and material resources, that that puts you at odds with family structures and national structures and, and structures, and that we'll, we'll end up finding enemies in places we didn't expect when we start to try to live from that place of freedom. Um, the other thing uh, that occurs to me when I read this passage is how quickly my ego wants me to not be the ruler in this case. I can find all the reasons that I'm not a rich ruler right now. I don't have enough in my bank account to be a rich ruler. Nobody listens to me. Why would I be a ruler, right? But if you really think about it with just a little bit of imagination, the fact that you have dominion over your own body, the fact that you have any amount of material goods in your life at all makes you a ruler over that little bit. And so I think this still applies to us. This whole conversation is directed at us. Um, so let's go back to the beginning and kind of break it down a couple lines at a time. Uh, verses 18 and 19 says, uh, And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Uh, I think this is interesting right off the bat because the ruler approaches Jesus with very refined language, uh, with a bit of flattery, which I think is probably, you know, if he's a rich ruler, he's got to be uh, experienced in politics. He's got to understand how to get what he wants from people, how to be perceived as, as somebody who's wealthy and somebody who's got power. And so his approach to Jesus and calling him good teacher uh, reveals a couple of different things. First of all, that he's coming at it right away with this game of, of uh, hierarchy. And also that even in his wealth and in his rulership, he defers to Jesus. He still recognizes that Jesus and his disciples have something that he doesn't have, despite all of his wealth. Um, so there's recognition and deference to Jesus in this moment. Um, the ingratiating approach where you come in and you say, good teacher, you know, oh, wise, devout guru, what can I do? And Jesus just kind of laughs him off and says, uh, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. And I think there's something beautiful there where the most perfect being to put on a human form rejects the idea of a truly good person and points out that all goodness comes from the source through us. And if it is our obsession with being a good person that makes us want to find good people, but I don't think that they exist, and I think Jesus is affirming that, that it's not about being a good person, it's about being open to the source of all goodness at any moment. Um, and I think also he's, he's in a way calling out the superficiality or the flattery from that ruler as he approaches him. So verses 20 and 21, uh, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all of these I've kept from my youth. So um, still playing along with, you know, the, the appearances game as this ruler approaches him, he gives him a very religious answer, a very simple religious answer for a very simple religious question. Because he said, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? He says, well, you know what you're supposed to do. These, are, these laws still stand. These things are, are things that we're supposed to be doing. And it's, I think, a way for Jesus to get him to change the question, to realize that if you want to ask for an itemized list, you can have that, but that's not what you're asking for, honestly, if you really think about what we're talking about here. Um, so this brings the ruler to kind of change his frame of questioning uh, by acknowledging, well, I've, I've already done all that, and, and I think there's the unspoken acknowledgement that, you know, I've, I've been keeping these commandments from my youth, but I don't have this eternal life that you seem to have that you, you're holding on to right now. Um, The truth is that simply keeping the commandments is not the same as living from a place of, of total connection to God, of total salvation, of, of that 
awestruck wonder with this existence and, and all of that freely given love and, and yeah. Um, so verses 22 and, and uh, well, just verse 22 for now. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. I think, th I mean, this is the entire gospel. It's a, it, it's a complete challenge of, of expectations, of the games that this ruler is playing, the games that allow him to have the wealth that he has, where he, he believes himself to be important enough to retain these resources and, and to lord them out and, and do with them what he wishes and that sort of thing. And so Jesus points out, there's your problem. You think that you own any of this. You think that, that this defines you, and it's keeping you from being your truest self. Um, it's not one of the Ten Commandments. He didn't follow up with, you know, he gave five commandments. He didn't follow up with one of the other, you know, five. He said, he gave him a piece of wisdom that's not meant to be seen as a moral law or a rule. It's not part of a checklist. It's a complete and radical change of approach to existence. Um, Jesus is describing a radically different perspective of survival, a total change of motivation, not following moral law for self-preservation, but giving freely as a means of full participation in creation. Um, Jesus here is revealing that true salvation is to give as freely as you receive and to be free from the psychological and spiritual and physical burdens of luxury. Um, it's just so powerful to me that it's that simple, that when you look at what makes us unwell in this life, so much of it has to do with, as far as I can see, retention. It has to do with holding on too tightly to things that are meant to be fluid, meant to, meant to come and go. Whether that's physical resources or, or abstract resources like time and energy, or even your mindset. And I think, uh, I forgot to preface it with this, but the verse right before this entire passage, Jesus gives another example of uh, saying that in order to enter the kingdom of God, you need to approach it like children. And he uses that all the time. And I think what we're supposed to take from that is, you know, when, when you're a child and you're fresh and you come into this world, you don't know, you don't have any expectations, you don't have any experiences that are causing you to try to predict what's going to happen and try to make choices based on that. You're just here for the ride. You're just here to see what happens next. And I think that every time Jesus goes to teach us anything, he's reminding us, like, hey, it's, it's your clinging in your own mind to the way things are supposed to be, to the way that it was handed to you, that's keeping you from, from seeing it as it actually is. Um, and then in verse 23, I think this verse itself encapsulates everything that we experience as believers. You know, we have so many songs and so many scriptures and so many examples in our lives of believing, of, of wanting to participate in this kingdom, wanting to, to give, surrender fully to Jesus, but there's this sadness in us. There's this part of us that feels absolutely confronted by that. Um, so verse 23 says, but when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. I, I think we all relate to that no matter how much stuff we have, no matter what numbers in our bank account, the idea of letting go of all of it, even though in theory it sounds beautiful to be free from all of that expectation, there's something terrifying <laughs> on this physical plane, in this part of, of our lives that, that doesn't want us, that, that we, we just, we can't imagine just giving it all away, just absolutely giving it all away. Um, and I think it's interesting too that in, in this language it says, uh, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Do you think that the degree of sadness correlates to the amount of, of wealth that you're giving up? Do you think if you had just a few dollars and you had to give that away, you'd be less sad? I don't know if that's the case, but I think it's interesting. I think those of us that have a little bit less can imagine this a little bit more easily than those of us that have so much, because where's the threshold? Where, what's the, you know, when you're accruing wealth, where's the line that says, okay, now I'm rich. Okay, now I'm covered. Everything's golden. It doesn't exist. No matter who you are, how much you have, there's never enough when you're looking at material resources as being everything. 
This moment is a reflection for all of us. Uh, it shows us the very thing that keeps us from surrendering fully. It's that we're afraid of experiencing loss. That what little bit we've come to know in this lifetime is so, has such a, a strong presence in our lives that we, we just, we absolutely cannot fathom releasing it, even when instructed to. Uh, it, it represents all of our desire to be better, to be saved, but without fully surrendering what's holding us back. Um, verse 24 and 25, it says, uh, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. If the prerequisite for entering the kingdom of God is to engage in absolute radical charity, then Jesus is confirming here that we ourselves find this an impossible requirement. Um, he responds to our sadness in this verse. When the ruler is downcast about having to part with his wealth, that's the part that Jesus seems to focus on. He says that's the problem, is that you, your frame of mind and, and the way that you see this world leads you to believe that you're losing something when you give away all of that wealth. Um, and then in the, in the next verse where he, he talks about the eye of the needle, um, I've heard uh, some debates back and forth with people uh, saying that there was a gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle and that it was possible for a camel to pass through it. They just had to take all of the stuff off the camel and, and guide it through. Um, but doing some research for this today, I found some suggestions that that gate or the concept of that gate didn't exist for 600, 700 years uh, after uh, this was written down. But I think the metaphor still stands. It's still interesting because uh, in the Jewish tradition uh, with the Old Testament, there's a collection of writings and musings called the Talmud. And the Talmud is, it's a commentary. It's where the teachers of scripture throughout the ages have, it's like instead of writing in the margins of the book, they've kind of just written a separate book to go along with it, where they're unpacking these ideas and trying to teach them more fully to each other. And uh, the, the phrase, I have the needle, or I have a needle, is all throughout the Talmud. And it represents something that appears impossible to us, but that is not technically impossible. Uh, it's just that from our perspective, from our limited understanding, it's something that's unfathomable, trying to, to thread that needle. Um, Jesus is not saying here that the wealthy can't enter the kingdom of God. And, and I think it's important, again, to remember that this version of the kingdom of God, it may be better not to think of it as a future destination, but as a present possibility. If we're talking about, you know, in, in previous weeks when we spoke about the kingdom of God, we talked about this idea of living from that place of radical charity where we're in a community that is so plugged into the source of love and life that we're not worried about keeping score. We're not worried about making sure we have enough because we know it's all flowing freely. I think that exists here and now whenever we choose to tap into it. And I think that what Jesus is saying is that for those of us who identify with our wealth, who believe ourselves to be rich at any level, or even believe ourselves to be poor because it's still an attachment to the idea of wealth, it's nearly impossible for us to enter that mindset, that mindset, uh, that mental state of, of absolute freedom, of total giving, of total charity, and, and that wide open wonder with what this life is and can be, uh, because we are so obsessed with the material. Uh, verse 26 and 27. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Those who heard this conversation spoke up and said, is it, like, can it be possible? And, and Jesus had to say, well, of course it is, just not from your perspective, not with your tools and your understandings of this reality. You have to surrender all of that to let God move through you and, and replace it with a, a more realistic version of what can happen here, what, what's, 
what's going on. Um, we really can't imagine choosing material poverty. Those of us that do, uh, you know, we, there's a, a trope, you know, the, the monks that, that renounce all of their belongings, they go live in the monastery, or the ascetics that punish themselves and believe that this life is not supposed to be full of any kind of joy, that it's just supposed to be pain, and that if you can endure that, then you're going to be rewarded in the next life. Um, but realistically, all of those attitudes are still obsessed with stuff, you know, refusing stuff or, or clamoring after stuff. It's just stuff. And I think that Jesus is constantly trying to get us to see that if we just let go of this attachment to stuff, that the, the realest thing is right here in front of us. It's right inside of us. And, and all we have to do is just kind of dig it up to, to enjoy it. Um, when Jesus tells him to sell his belongings and, and to come follow him, he's not prescribing the material act, but he's trying to lead him to an internal shift. He's trying to challenge that internal perspective that is so obsessed with wealth. He's trying to get him to totally let go of that idea of existence. If we can stop seeing ourselves as any shade of wealthy, whether that's extremely wealthy or moderately wealthy or not wealthy at all, stop thinking about ourselves as, as owning anything, then those resources belong to the kingdom. They belong to any and all who need them. And it's that simple. But even talking about it right now, it feels impossible to us, right? We have to let go of ourselves entirely to be transformed. And, and once again, I think that's what the gospel is supposed to show us, that this is a universe that is full of, of cycles. There's, there's life and death. Uh, there's ups and downs, there's joy and sadness, and we get so stuck trying to keep things happy, trying to keep things good, trying to hold on to this life. We're, we're clinging so hard to these things that we're not enjoying the ride for what it is. We're not experiencing the fullness of this thing. Great love and great suffering both have the potential to strip away all of that identity, all of that clinging, and bring us to that place inside of us that is so directly attached to God. When you experience great love through another person, you catch a glimpse of God's love for us, for this, for existence itself. And it, it reminds us that all the other stuff is secondary. More often than that, though, we have to have these things stripped away from us to remember that. We have to experience absolute loss to remember that we don't need much to survive. I'm very fortunate to be married to somebody who enjoys leaving everything behind and walking into the woods for, for days at a time. Because I, I never would have experienced that otherwise. That seemed crazy to me. And then I went with her. And I realized that I could live with what I could carry. And not only that, but I was enjoying life more when I didn't have stuff to worry about. Nothing to draw my attention away. Just the trees in front of me and the trees behind me and, and you know, my house on my back and that was it and I think that this entire passage I think it triggers a feeling of guilt in us we identify if we identify with the ruler then we feel that same sadness and we don't know how to let go but I think that it's supposed to encourage us to begin the process of, of trying to understand how we could get from the ruler to that salvation that Jesus is offering, to that freedom. What can we start doing now to start becoming free from all of this stuff? Um, if we can practice letting go of what, what hinders us, if we can practice letting go of things a little at a time and being okay with that, then we can expect to live without a fear of loss. We can expect to encounter moments of great change in our lives without being overcome with sorrow and sadness and debilitated by the sudden realization that the things we thought were always going to be there aren't always going to be there. Um, so verses 28 and 29. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. 
I think here that eternal life seems to have much more to do with a fullness than a longevity. It's not necessarily about the quantity of life. It's not about each of us individuals securing for ourselves an eternity, so much as it is tapping into that wellspring of eternal life that is here and now and allowing this to exist in the first place. That if we, for the sake of participating in the kingdom, let go of the stuff that's holding us back and, and, and even end relationships if we have to, where those relationships demand us to, to stay identified with station and with material. If we let go of those things willfully, we have access to that eternal life immediately and it meets us there. And I think we've all experienced it in little ways here and there, you know, when you, like spring cleaning, when you, when you clean out the closet and you get rid of a bunch of stuff, oh, doesn't that feel better, you know? Such a small example of what's being talked, to, talked about here, just a, a small facet of that absolute freedom where we don't need stuff to survive. Um, I think that here Jesus is suggesting, as he does so many times throughout his, his gospel, so many times throughout scripture, that it's better for us to lose everything we think we're supposed to have if it allows us to participate more fully in the kingdom right here and right now. And I think it's been one of the biggest mistakes of Christianity over the last several hundred years to develop into this mindset of punishment and reward where we're so obsessed with future reward, with future participation in the kingdom, that we have to do things now so that we can do something later. That's a very human idea when it seems that God is right here, right now, that freedom is right here and right now. That reality is absolutely right here and right now. All things in this world have an end. All things. This world itself has an end. None of this is permanent. How tightly are we holding on to temporary things? How strong is our grip on the ephemeral, and how much is that keeping us from seeing this reality as it actually is? I would, uh, I would like to encourage us to practice letting go in little ways as much as we can. And one of the easiest and most profound ways that I've found and obviously throughout all this I struggle. I, I still have a lot of really nice stuff and I'm still trying to figure out how to, how to let go of it. But one of the most practical and immediate ways that we can all begin to practice letting go is to turn our prayer time into silence and reflection. To stop filling that space with thoughts at God and demands from God and fears about the future or regrets about the past just letting go of all of that and focusing on, on just silent communion with the spirit that's alive in you right now. And I'd like to invite all of us to do that right now. Just close your eyes right where you are. Take a couple of deep breaths. Focus on what it feels like to be in your body and not have a thought moving through your mind. And, and when you find yourself thinking, as you will, don't hold on to that thought. Just let it go. Return your, return your attention to breathing, to, to your heartbeat, to whatever it is that reminds you that God's right here inside you. Let's just hold this silence for just a moment. a lot of us are really uncomfortable but when you practice going there willfully when you practice intentionally letting go of all of the activity all of the stuff you'll find that God's right there waiting for you and he's, he's got more in store for you in that silence than hours of lectures and discussions of, of, of reading the kingdom is right here among us the truth is already inside of us all we have to do is choose to let God use us to, to become a part of that. Father, we're grateful to be in your presence today, to have another day on this planet. 
I pray, Lord, that tomorrow as we wake up, we would remember that you're right here with us from the jump. That we would remember all of the stuff that wants our attention right away, all of those worries and concerns, all of the obsessions with material belongings and, and maintaining those resources. None of that matters because you're giving us the breath that we're using to get it done so freely. I pray, Lord, that you would open every heart in this room to that reality, to, to your reality, to your presence right here and right now, and that you would help us to become conduits of your kingdom, that we would become the vessels through which your presence comes and makes a difference here in the communities where we already are. I pray, Lord, that no matter how large or small our fortunes are, we would stop identifying with those fortunes, that we would stop thinking of ourselves as owning any of it so that we could more readily participate in this beautiful existence that you've given us. I'm grateful for every heart in this room, and I pray that you would help us to enjoy the rest of this beautiful Sunday as we go forth from here. In your son's name, amen.